checking out this video. My name's Jana, and today we're going to be talking about a board game called Sleeping Gods. This is an adventure style game and it's for one to four players and it plays in many, many hours depending on how long you would like to play. It's recommended for ages 13 and up. So this is a story driven adventure game where you and up to three of your friends take on the roles of the nine crew members of the Manticore, which is a cargo ship that was that's bound for New York somewhere in the 20th century. After a wild storm, you all wake up and find that you are marooned in strange waters that are speckled with mysterious islands all over the place. The only explanation is that the gods have summoned you and you can't go home until you've wakened them up. Yeah, they're summoning you in their sleep. It's it's serious. So the goal of the game is to find as many special totems throughout your adventures as you can, because those totems are what will wake the gods. So the way that this game works is that like I said, there's nine crew members and up to four people can play and you can split the different characters up in however way you want. The captain is always in play on everyone's turn. So if you're playing two player, each of you would have four characters that are yours in addition to sharing the captain. So on your turn, you get to do a ship action, you have to deal with an event and then you get two additional actions that will involve traveling, exploring, which is opening up the storybook and seeing what stories are available, and then going to port or going to market to get some new items. When you encounter events or encounters in the book, in the adventure book, some things that you will need are command tokens, which are the little blue tokens that allow you to make actions and make different characters do things. Your fellow teammates can actually use command tokens on your turn to help you in an event if needed. Command tokens are extremely important and you're constantly getting those in the ship action, but you're also having to spend an action to return them to the ship so that you can use them again. Other things that you may need are food, supplies, and money. In addition to these tokens, there are also skills that are required for different challenges. Cunning, strength, perception, craft, and savvy. So there's different symbols on each character which will let you know like what their skill, what they innately have as their skills. And then you can actually assign ability cards to different characters to um, amp up their abilities for future challenges. Let's say an event card is unfolded and you have to navigate through dangerous waters. You may need eight savvy to get through these difficult waters. So you might select two different characters that have the savvy symbol on them already. So those symbols count towards your eight, but that's not gonna be enough. So what you do is you flip over a fake card. The fake cards are the same as the ability cards. The ability card section is in the bottom part, but the fate number is in the left hand corner. And this acts as a six sided dice, which helps us to determine what will happen when we have encounters, combat, or other challenges. If the number is high enough for you to achieve the goal of eight savvy, then you will have, you know, succeeded in your challenge. If it's not enough to cover the savvy that you required, then you will have failed and some uh, you know, bad thing might happen, like you might damage the ship slightly. So exploring in this game is basically saying, I'm gonna explore at a number on the map. You're gonna open the book up to that spot to that part of the story and it might say something like you went on an island and you found a creature and the creature is hurt you can either try to help it or kill it for meat read a if you're going to help it and read b if you're going to kill it for meat and then it will probably give you a challenge you might have to have a lot of strength to kill it or to heal it you may need 
perception or something of that nature. Depending on what decision you make and what the outcome is, you may end up getting a quest. These quests are sometimes in the form of jobs or pleas for help or clues as to what happened to you and where the totems are for the sleeping gods. The quest cards also have keywords on them, which you use when you come into new stories. Having the keyword from something you did in the past will give you access to special parts of future storylines. Or you may end up failing and have some sort of negative thing happen to you, but the story will continue differently based off of the decisions that you make in each encounter. So the game will go on like this for three rounds. Each round is triggered by the end of the event deck. When you come to the end of the event deck, you will have a little story to read to kind of direct you and where you're going with the story. When you come to the third round, you read the story and then you see what you were able to achieve, what you were able to collect. You will get points for doing different quests and for having gotten different totems. At the end of the campaign, you'll get a score and you may or may not get to unlock some new cards for your next campaign. On your encounters, you may make friends or enemies. When you make these enemies, you may have to do a challenge or more likely, you'll have combat. When there's combat, you will have uh, enemies that will be revealed on cards. And on the enemies card, there's a grid and in the grid are hearts, which symbolize that enemy's health. You have to meet the accuracy requirements to hit the enemy, but then you also have to deal the damage to take that enemy out. When you're in combat, command tokens are extremely important, as well as having extra ability cards and being able to manipulate the fate deck to your advantage as much as you can. When you are able to hit an enemy, the damage must be placed on the card in either horizontal or vertical lines. You cannot place them diagonally. So you have a little bit of a visual puzzle as you're trying to attack your enemy. Also, the lines proceed into the next enemy. So if you have an enemy that's really hard to hit, but you're able to hit the weaker guy, the damage could overflow into that more powerful enemy's card, which is a really neat thing that happens. So I've been thinking about what I was gonna say about Sleeping Gods for a long time. We started playing it in the summer and we just wrapped up our session now. So I've had a lot of time to think about it. I like that it captures the rhythm of a D&D &D session with the ease of a storybook. See, see, I was thinking about it. That's a good thing to say. What do I mean by the rhythm of a D&D session? Well, in D&D, you have these characters and uh, the building of the characters and that whole, that whole relationship you, you have with your character, you don't have that same depth here. But it does have the rhythm of having a big plot, different storylines and quests coming in and out. You have decisions to make that will have direct effects on you as a crew, but also on your characters individually. After you've had an encounter, accomplished a quest, or had combat, you heal, you go buy new stuff, and then you do it all over again. And that's very much how a D&D session feels. I think the combat is one of the most successful things of this game because it really does give you that feeling of time being slowed down as you enter into combat. You have to think in slow down motions and I really like how they capture that but in a way that is not rules heavy and does not slow down the momentum of the story. As soon as the combat is over the story will commence. So I really like that. It really brings you right back and you will either have great rewards or maybe have made a mistake and maybe attack the wrong people. And, and in that regard, it feels like you were really contributing to the story yourself. Another thing that is exceptionally well done in this game is the fact that you can add and take away players like no problem. So this is what happened. We played sleeping gods for hours at a time, my husband and I, like five hours at one time, four hours and another time, like we just, 
you know, gobbled it up. So when we were wrapping up the session, my husband did get a little tired of not really being able to accomplish the end goal as fast as we wanted to. I ended up completing the campaign by myself. And what I discovered is that it was so easy. Basically, he returned some of his ability cards and walked away from the table and I got to, you know, continue playing. There isn't any changing of the deck or resetting anything else on the board. I love how they streamlined the process of adding and taking away players. Another thing that I absolutely love about Sleeping Gods is the artwork. Of course, you know I was going to say this. I love Ryan Lockett's artwork. I love the worlds that he creates. And this game, I mean, it just did not disappoint. There are loads of cards that are beautifully illustrated, unique artwork, and you really get an entire feeling of an entire world that is encapsulated in Sleeping Gods. The only con that we really felt after a while, the quest can be a little fatiguing. Sometimes they don't really have the rewards that you want. Sometimes you go in a wrong direction and it ends up being a dead end or ends up setting you back some ways. And when you're trying to accomplish that angle of like really discovering the gods and the totems, you kind of just get tired of doing the other quest. So that's what happened to my husband. He just was like, I'm done. I don't know where this is going. It's almost over. Why don't you just finish it? So that happened. And I can totally understand why. I mean, he loses interest <laughs> in lots of things after a while. There, I mean, it does have that um, drawback for people that lose interest in doing the same thing uh, over and over again. I'm not saying that Sleeping Gods is redundant, but just the same thing of like, go to this place, read the story, may or may not be a dead end. We don't want to miss anything, but it's also becoming a little tedious. I actually enjoyed going on without him. I could take my time uh, reading everything. I am a slower reader, so it gave me more time to just absorb everything at my own pace. And I'm pretty sure I made choices Daniel might not have. Those differences in making choices in the storyline are something that makes Sleeping Gods really unique. Some of the storylines are pretty clear cut and some of them are a little like gray areas. You're not sure what the right choice is. You kind of have to just go with what you would do. You make a choice, you don't really know what the end result will be, but then later on you run into that same plot line in a different part of the map and you have the keyword because you made a specific choice, you know, whatever sessions ago, and it made a difference in your future storyline. That is really cool. And that is what feels a little bit like a D&D session to me. Now we're going to talk about the eco-friendliness of Sleeping Gods. This is something that I do for all my board game reviews now. The first star is because there is no plastic box insert. In fact, the boxes that come with Sleeping Gods are very practical for their storage sake because they hold everything for sessions that are in play. All the characters have plastic bags fitted for the, the character boards and then for any tokens or cards that would go along with that character at whatever point you stopped playing the game. It has a lot of reasons for needing storage for the type of game that it is, and it's done very, very well. I wouldn't say that any of the plastic bags in Sleeping Gods were non-essential. I also liked that they came in these boxes in different sizes that you kind of puzzle in. The effect is that it feels like a cargo ship with cargo in the box. So I really like that they went with that choice. It took away the need for any plastic box insert, which the plastic box inserts that we're used to seeing in our board games are normally a non-recyclable black flimsy plastic. This is where my writing system kind of breaks apart, <laughs> breaks down a little bit. Um, I want to give Sleeping Gods half a star for not having a ton of plastic in it. It's not the same as no plastic, 
you get a star. But the only plastic in this game is the manticore, which it's not essential to the game, but I really like it. And the plastic ring binders, which are very practical for the type of books that they are. While I don't like having plastic in my board games, the plastic that is in Sleeping Gods is very practical and seems like they thought out why they wanted to use plastic for those pieces. I don't feel like there was an excessive use of plastic pieces, so I wanted to give them at least half a star for that. When I ask the people at Red Raven about any sustainability goals or, or initiatives, they said they didn't really have very much information about that, but then Ryan Lockett emailed me and he said he'd really like to learn more about it. And I appreciated his initiative to actually email me personally and find out more about what I was doing. And unfortunately, that's all the stars I could give. Either the information wasn't available for me to rate it or they just didn't do the other eco-friendly things. If you're curious about how I rate games for eco-friendliness, you can check out my video about that in um, either the description box below or I'll put a little card for that. I'm not giving a star for this, but I just wanted to say that Sleeping Gods achieved an awesome legacy style feeling game without being a legacy game. I can play this game over and over and over and over again with as many people as I want to and I can resell it and I don't have to purchase anything else. Sleeping Gods does have expansions, but they're not necessary to the base game. So there's a lot of replayability with that same feeling of a legacy. If you like legacy games, this is the game to get because other legacy games are wasteful and walking away from what we love about board games and that is their replayability. When I think about returning to Sleeping Gods and playing it for future campaigns, I'm really looking forward to it. The possibilities seem almost endless. And as I was playing it solo and making choices on my own, my kids kind of gathered around and wanted to know what I was doing. And they asked to hear the stories and they put in their input. And I realized, oh boy, this is gonna be fun. For my final rating of Sleeping Gods, I'm giving it five pips out of six. And that is because it is an extremely successful, story-driven adventure game. And none of the other adventure games I've tried have come close to being as good as Sleeping Gods. I don't know why I'm not giving it a full six pips. I'm feeling a little conflicted. It's definitely getting five and it's pushing for six. I think it all depends on when I get to play it again. I think it's because it's a little lot. <laughs> if you know what I mean, it's a little too much. It's a lot to set up. It's a bit of an event to play. We're probably not gonna play it as much as we'd like, as much as we would play like some of our other lighter, easier, more convenient games. I think that's the only thing that's keeping it from getting a solid six pips. Overall, it's an awesome, awesome game. I highly recommend it. Thanks so much for watching this review, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye. When you're able to attack an enemy, your damage must go in a, what is it called? <laughs> Abdominal in either horizontal, <laughs> horizontal, which is kind of a, a cool thing. I, isn't it beautiful? And it's recommended for ages 14 and up. 13 and up.